is an Unspoiled Network podcast. This is Unspoiled, covering Justified, Season 5, Episode 2. The kids aren't all right. In this episode, Loretta's back. Sure, why not? Welcome to Unspoiled. On this lonely road, trying to make it home, doing it while my boss and pissed off the boss song. I'm fighting for my soul, God, get at you, boy. You try to hold on, fall back, I go hard. On this lonely road, trying to make it home, doing it while my boss and pissed off the boss song. I see them all hard times to come. Hi, everybody. What's up, everybody? My name's Natasha. My name's Alan. Yay. And her name is Loretta. Who saw that coming? Yeah, I didn't think she was going to come back. I actually, that's not entirely true. I kind of thought she would because the way they like left it felt like that's not something the show does all that often. Like usually people have to die before they're really gone. <laughs> that's um, fair. And I was like willing to accept if she just went off screen because she's a kid and maybe they don't want to just kill her. But. I kind of figured she's at the kind of age where she would be, a, they could use her as a real character. So mm -hmm. they would bring her back probably. I just didn't really see that coming here because it felt like they had set up so much previously um, for the premiere that did not have anything to do with her. And I kind of thought that we had plenty to go on with without bringing a new plot thread into it. But right. sure. I don't feel like this was like uh this didn't. This wasn't super compelling to me, but mm -hmm. it it also didn't elicit that like, oh, who cares? Let's talk about the other thing, you know. So that's fine. Yeah, ex exactly. This this episode is fine. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with it, but uh, it is kind of odd that they would slow down like that after mm -hmm. setting up so much. But it's like you said, they could have. This could have been a whole lot worse if they went with the brand new people, but instead, hey, it's Hot Rod again, and it's Loretta again, and it's Avon Barksdale. And Hot Rod's enjoyable, man. He is enjoyable. <laughs> he is enjoyable. Um, so that's cool. I mean, just the fact that they wanted to use established characters and remind us that these are still people who exist in the world. Mm -hmm. so, so, yeah, nothing wrong with it. Um, this episode is, yeah, season five. Episode two, The Kids Aren't All Right, written by Dave Andron, directed by Bill Johnson. They are both longtime Justified people. Um, and, uh, yeah. Avon Barksdale's so, here. He is. Avon Barksdale is the first thing we see. It's Avon beating up a dude. I was just like, what the fuck? What's up? Right? I love whenever he shows up and stuff, because it feels like he's in everything. Yeah. Um, or like, at least he's in the things I keep watching. <laughs> and it's funny, because I don't, like, I see him, and I'm immediately like, Oh, here's the large and in charge guy, but he's like a doofus in this a little bit. Like he oh, yeah. has, he's, he's definitely more in charge than some people that we have seen, but he's, uh, I, I just kind of expected him to fall into his Avon type role and they were like not doing that at all. So it kind of caught me by surprise because I just associate him so heavily with that role that you know how that is. You see an actor that you've only seen mm -hmm. in like one thing for an extended period and then that's all you think of every time you see them. And it's almost like they're acting out of character when they do anything else. You're like, yeah. Avon, why are you flipping out on this guy? <laughs> well, he's, no, is that's it, not who this is. Is it Ant-Man where he's a police detective? Mm-hmm. And I just don't buy it for a second. Mm-hmm. Like Which just, has nothing I mean, to do with Wood Harris, but just like, no, no, he's Avon Barksdale. Yeah, what is the other? There was something no. else that I saw. Oh, he was in Dread. That's right. And he plays a shitbag in Dread. Have you ever seen Dread? I have. I don't remember that, though. Oh, my God. He's the guy that they uh, are holding on to for a little while for information that does the kind of like uh, thing with when he's messing with the girl's head because she can read minds. Okay. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's ringing a bell. And it is a very ugly scene that she manages quite deftly. Um but yeah, guys, if you haven't seen Dread, it's on par with John Wick in being like balls to the walls, bananas, and for some reason got totally overlooked. It's just, it's beautifully done. It's a gorgeous and visceral and crazy ass movie that doesn't stop for a second. And I highly recommend it. 
Yeah, and I think it suffered from a lot of bad press just because it was following up that awful, awful, awful Judge Dredd movie from the 90s. Mm -hmm. um, Yeah, they did something totally other with it that is just remarkable. And I think I heard that they were looking at doing a sequel because it kind of got popular after it was released on DVD. Everybody was suddenly like, oh, shit, look at this. Kind of like what happened with John Wick, really. I heard that, too. And I also remember Dredd was in, not a controversy, but there was a thing where... Another movie came out at almost the same time in, is it maybe South Korean? A movie called The Raid, which hmm. is almost the exact same premise. Um, it's just he's a, he's, like a, he's a cop or a SWAT guy or something who needs to fight his way up to, up to the top of an apartment building um, oh. in order to save somebody or something like that. It, but it's, it's essentially the same plot. And so there was a lot of... Uh, side eyeing of like, did they rip off this movie's plot? And apparently, no. They just happened to make basically the same movie at the same time. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah. I wonder how the other one was. If that one was any good, like the raid know. was decent. It was. I mean, it was, it was a kung fu movie more than anything else, or like a like a maybe a a gun fu movie, like whatever they call those. Um, mm-hmm. Trying to think, but yeah, it was decent. They made a sequel, which I heard was not nearly as good. But it that definitely had its own sort of cult following, and uh, yeah, I mean, they're both fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway. No, that's that's a bummer because like I was just saying that um, Krista shared a link to an interesting sounding fantasy series that's going to be coming out, um, a book series, and I got really panicked when I was reading the overall synopsis of it because it sounded in some ways real similar to the idea behind my book series that I'm working on. And it would just be so sad to put that kind of work into something and then have it come out and be almost exactly the same as something else. Like there's just no way to predict something like that. And that's just like, I, there, there's nobody at fault when that kind of thing happens, but it would just make me so sad. Um, and yeah, I never even heard about that until now. So bummer. Yeah. But anyway, uh, anyway, anyway, yeah. So, um, so Avon Barksdale, uh, Wood Harris is the actor actually, and he is he is Jay, and him and his buddy Roscoe are uh, like lieutenants for Hot Rod, mm-hmm. and they are beating up this guy Marcus, who is one of their dealers who got stiffed by a couple of teenagers mm-hmm. because he didn't bother to actually check anything. He just thought that it looked good, so it must be fine. And they oh, made dude. off. Yeah. So they've got him all tied to a chair. Hot Rod comes up and he is uh, he is not happy about this. So he interrogates him for just a little bit. Makes Can him feel I tell bad you, about I himself. I really <laughs> thought that he was going to rip that earring out of his ear. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they oh do tease God. that. I was fucking waiting for it. I was shocked that he didn't. I guess he's just not really that type. Like, he isn't a cruel man, you know? <laughs> right. But... Uh, I kind of forgot my assessment of him because I, we haven't really seen him for like what a whole season. Yeah, it's he, I don't think he was in season four at all. Yeah, so I couldn't remember, and I wouldn't have been surprised if he did it. But I like that he didn't. Like, thanks, dude. It was not necessary. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that made me tense up a lot. <laughs> yeah, but see, he's not the kind of guy who would rip someone's earring out. But he is somebody who would absolutely order his lieutenants to shoot the man dead. Which is mm-hmm. what he does. So Jay and Roscoe SEAL Team Six him. Yeah, what is that? I mean, SEAL Team Six is the team that took down Bin Laden, which I, so I assume it just means you shoot on sight and you know pump his guts full of lead. <laughs> you got. <laughs> uh, what is it that he so, says? You got uh, ten seconds to get your ugly, no good, yellow keister off my property before I pump your guts full of lead. Um, but yeah, they turn around and shoot him like what ten times? A lot. <laughs> yeah, Yikes. and it's it, and I, I don't have the exact dialogue up in front of me, but they're having like a contest uh, mm-hmm. about it to see who's cooler while they do it, or like how many times they can hit him while just turning and shooting and. From the hip. Yeah, he says the tightest wins. Yeah. 
which uh, I was like, I'm not sure what that means. Tightest shit wins, which maybe they can tell their bullets part and they just want to see who can shoot like the closest together. Right. Yeah. Just I don't like know. Robin Hood bow and arrow contest. Right? <laughs> How many arrows yeah. can you get close to each other? Maybe. But um, we never really find out who wins that contest. So uh, they shoot him dead. And then we go to the hospital where it turns out Lee Paxton is still alive. Yeah, this fucker causing trouble still. Goddamn yeah. pain in the ass. Yeah, he is comatose, but he is still here. And uh, he is being watched over by Mara, his wife, and Nick Mooney, who is finally the sheriff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Nick Mooney, you garbage human. I hate your it's face. Human. He is the perfect face for a douchebag. Mm-hmm. Like, there's a line in Gone Girl where the guy who's being accused of murder realizes that everybody's going to believe he did it because he just has that face. The face that is easy to hate because he looks like a prep school douchebag. Yeah. And I could totally see this guy being uh, cast in that role if they were to do that. They actually cast Ben Affleck, which was perfect. Also works. <laughs> But this guy would also work, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, he kind of looks like the bad guy in an 80s movie about a college. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. That's exactly the line! Did you read yeah. Gone Girl? Didn't. Oh no, my god, that's that... exactly the line when she first meets him, was that her first impression of him was that he looked like the bad guy from an 80s high school movie. That's hysterical. I love that. Well done, sir. Can I say? It's a gift. <laughs> but he is, uh, Mooney that is, is talking to Mara, essentially saying, like, so we're pretty sure we know who did this. Boyd Crowder, he's short and he's got weird hair and he's got giant teeth. He smiles a lot. And th- was that the guy? And she says, yeah. Yeah, not immediately, like, what the fuck? But she folds pretty fast. I The only thing I could think was that it had something to do with him still being alive. And it turns out that I was not wrong, but it wasn't what I thought. Um, and yeah, I was like so thrown when she said yes. Yeah, he says she's got a smile that that could blind you. Yeah, and I was like, that's a pretty fucking apt description, to be perfectly honest. Yeah, a little bit but, poetic uh, for this cop dude, but sure. <laughs> yeah, so Mara is uh, again. She we find out that there's more to this later, but she folds surprisingly quickly. Uh, and then we go and we meet Raylan and Tim and Rachel uh, in a gigantic house that's owned by a Detroit mob accountant. And he's handcuffed and complaining. And oh, we see guy. all of the shit this guy has. He's in a giant mansion with a bowling alley. He's got an antique Civil War pistol. He's got a cook who makes him iguana. It's very tender. Uh, he's he very has tender. A... Oh, my gosh. <laughs> fucking kill- That line delivery... She needs her own show. It, it's perfect, pretty perfect. <laughs> <laughs> and then he's got, like, I forget what he calls her, but basically a, a personal attendant. Yeah. So, this one. And, uh, I, I love it because Rachel's like, does this not bother you? Because he has a, conf- the, the pistol is from a Confederate general. Yeah. And he's like, <laughs> yes, Raylan, do you know how much that's worth? And he just goes, hundred bucks. I love when he does that. Oh my god! He's like tells him whose it used to be and how old it is. So more than a hundred. More than hundred bucks. <laughs> oh my god, Raylan, you are such a crank. I love it. Yeah. Um, and he says something about how it probably just doesn't shoot anymore. And he says the hell it doesn't. I have a Negro something that loads them special for me. What is that he says? Yeah, he says. Um... I'm fine. Oh, I've got a Negro down in Alabama makes them loads special for me. And that's yeah. when Rachel says, this doesn't bother you at all? And the woman just goes, I make sure he don't keep the guns loaded in the house. She's yeah. totally unconcerned. Completely. She ain't my girlfriend. She's the maid. And she takes care of my more personal needs. Ew. I hate mm. him so much. Ugh, yeah, they, they do a good job. This show always does a good job creating very hateable people very quickly. Mm-hmm. 
Oh man, he has a bowling alley in the basement. I totally missed that. I forgot yeah. that that's what Raylan's talking about later when he's like, "So have you uh, bowled before?" <laughs> Bless. Yeah, and uh, we also find out that he has a really expensive car with a great sound system. And uh, oh, right. Yeah, and Raylan decides to borrow this. After he gets a phone call that accuses him for being responsible of this guy's teenage, teenager's drug problem. Yeah, this puzzled me greatly. I had I was gonna no ask, idea what to make and, of it. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, there are any number of things Raylan might or might not have done that would lead to that sort of in some weird roundabout way. Right. But uh, yeah, well, again, Loretta, I guess, sure. Sure, why not? Yeah, but they... Uh, they point out that Raylan's got to go, but they took his car. So Raylan takes this guy's car. Oh, my God. And, and he, he does has to it. stop and be like, yeah. hey, this is such a great song on the way out. Like, he's a <laughs> petty motherfucker. Completely. So that takes us to our opening credits. And uh, when we come back, we are in prison again with Boyd and Ava and their lawyer, the wild man, wearing his headphones. Oh my god, that moment. Ain't nobody talking to you. Put your goddamn headphones back on. Oh, this guy, he's so bored. It's not <laughs> even just about like, no, we need to talk about stuff. He's just like, why am I here? God, it's great. I love it. He's getting paid. That should be enough. True, true. <laughs> but Ava is, uh, she's upset and she's starting to lose it a little. She mm -hmm. just kind of like, it sucks in here. And it's what is she? It's, it's degrading and it. It's yeah, humiliating. Humiliating. Yeah. Humiliating. And and he's like, uh, yeah, I know, I done it, yeah. I done done it. Um, but I was glad that he finally said the thing that I was saying, like two episodes ago, where she was just like, "Are you sure this is gonna work?" And I'm like, "Lady, you need to stop because you're the one who caused all this," and. Not that I'm saying that you didn't do the right thing in the moment because that man needed to fucking die, but you are just sitting here criticizing everything and not offering up your own ideas. And if you don't have any of your own ideas, maybe just keep your goddamn mouth shut. Mm. And he f doesn't get as harsh as I do, but he's still like, I would appreciate if you would keep in mind that I am doing everything I can for you. And I'm like, yeah, please keep it in mind, lady, because... It's not like this man is flush with options here. Like, and again, she's not offering her own ideas. So, right. you know, but, um, yeah, I'm just, just like, I, I, it's a shame because she was doing so much of her own thing that I was really respecting. And I feel like the show has pulled back on that a little bit because they're trying to be like, well, she f she decided that she wasn't going to shoot uh, Ellen May or the church lady. And so mm -hmm. she's kind of just pulled back on her power altogether. And I don't like that either or scenario. You know, I feel like she should still be coming up with ideas and ways to handle this and maybe just not want to be a murderer anymore. Which you is know? reasonable. <laughs> So, Which I don't is, know. I'm just kind of hoping they will deliver a little bit more with her coming up because um, her just basically sitting and holding, waiting for him to fix things is not exciting. So. Yeah. No, you're right. And obviously we haven't seen, well, anything of her at all really this season so far. Yeah. And I, I'm willing to see her take a step back right now because she is so far out of her depth. Mm-hmm. That I can see her willing to, well, willing to to take the passenger seat while she trusts Boyd, who has done this before, mm -hmm. and at the very least can exude the kind of confidence that she wants, mm -hmm. even if he doesn't really feel it. So I'm okay with it as long as you know, as long as it's not her entire story this season, you know. Right. Yeah. So. But I get why you're frustrated because yeah, she really has turned into such a. a motivated character yeah so. and like it's not it's not my frustration isn't that deep like because you know it doesn't there it, 
it, it's only a recent development with them doing this. It hasn't been going on for like episode after episode, you know, but it is just kind of a, um, something that I started to notice last episode with her being frustrated and directing it at him. So I'm kind of having less patience because I already started to feel like lady, come on a little bit ago. And now he's finally giving word to that. So I'm like, I really don't want this to turn into a thing between the two of them where he's just like getting resentful that it feels like he's watching her back and she's not contributing anything. Um, because I like the two of them working together. I like them as a couple, you know, right. which is nice because that's such a rare thing for me to like give a shit about pairings on shows. Like I don't care about relationships. A lot of the time, the, the whole shipping thing is not something that I've ever related to or participated in very much because it's usually not done that well. And it feels like it's a substitute for good writing. Um, but this is something that it's not about shipping them because I want to see them together. It's shipping them for practical reasons. Cause I'm just like, they could just do so well. It's like almost on the same level as wanting Boyd and Duffy to work together, you know, where I'm just sure. like, I just want to see them together on screen because they're good. So, well, yeah. let me ask, we haven't gotten a lot of Ava this season so far. What do you think her story is this season? I don't know. Like, is that's this... kind of my question, because that's, like, this can only go on for so long, and I don't right. want it to just be, she, her story is that she's motivating Boyd to go out and get things done. So, so do you th- is her story Ava's in prison all season? Is her story... I don't think so, but I don't know how that unhappens. Okay. Um... It would be cool if her story was Ava gets back at douchebag Mooney because he set them up. I would love that because Mooney is also clearly a little bit of a predator because the way that he was acting with, what's his wife's name? Mara. Mara. Um, It's obvious that when he was like, well, you just keep me close and you'll have nothing to worry about. And he puts his hand on the back of her neck. And I'm just like, oh, ew, like, come on. And she knows exactly what that means the second he does it, before he even does it. She's just like, yeah, uh uh-huh. So I would be down to see him get taken down a few pegs. And even if he's not a guy who would necessarily follow through on that sort of threat, Mm -hmm. he is somebody who is more than happy to use that implication. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, he is. Yeah, uh, it's like it's not necessarily – it doesn't have to be – followed through on like it, right. it it absolutely the fact that you're willing to make that statement in the first place knowing the kind of effect that it's going to have on her it's a power play and you're gross you right. know hey, do, <laughs> do you watch Joey sunny in philadelphia no there's a fantastic episode where i think it's actually called the gang buys a boat and two of the guys are uh, one of them mac is um, he's kind of a, well, he gets creepier and creepier as the seasons go on, but he starts off being, he's very self-obsessed and he's a ladies man. Um, okay. it goes way downhill from there, but in the, as they're getting stuff for their boat in the store, he's talking about all the things they're going to need and they're going to need mattress and they're going to, you know, cause we, that way we can get the girls out there. We can take them all the way out on the ocean and we can give them, you know, have food and drinks and, you know, and then the mattress is there because, well, because of the implication. And the other guy goes like, wait, what implication? Well, that, you know, the implication, I don't think I'm following you. <laughs> and they have so, it's, I'll send you the video clip. It's hysterical just to watch him try to explain how there's not going to be any actual rape, but the implication of rape me, makes this completely okay. Oh, my God. And it's uh, The show is so dark. It's so dark. And s- it's so twisted and so funny. But it's a, it's a great scene. And um, Mooney would feel right at home hanging out with, uh, with Dennis. Sorry, Mac is the other guy, Dennis. So... Yeah, that's something that I feel like is kind of, um, it's such a gray area that women don't like to talk about it because it's so difficult to really pinpoint when it happens. But there is, you know, there's talk about like peer pressure and stuff. 
but there is a vibe that some dudes have. And I'm really lucky in that I have, for some reason, always managed to avoid this type of dude personally. I think because my personality is such that they didn't want to put forth the effort to try and pull this on me. And it it's the kind but it's the kind of thing that I've seen happen like around me so I know what it what it looks like where a guy doesn't overtly do anything predatory. He doesn't actually say anything that's a threat really. But there is this sort of energy in the air where you feel like he only isn't because I'm being nice right now. And if I do or say anything that indicates I'm not interested in going along with what he clearly has planned, he could get really ugly. And that's kind of where I am with this dude, that he feels like he is one step away from snapping. And as long as you play pretty girl, he's fine. But the moment that you step out of that box, then forget it. And I think that's proven pretty true by the end of this. Like, Yeah. So, I, I would agree. I would agree. And I did just find that video clip and send it to you. You have, you have a minute and a half of your free time. <laughs> it's okay. pretty funny. And uh, yeah, and relevant. So anyway, though, Nick is the sheriff, and that sucks. Mm -hmm. Um he comes then to – sorry, we lose jail. <laughs> we, we lose jail. We lose jail? What's we leave jail. Are you broken? Yeah. <laughs> apparently, apparently, <laughs> we leave the setting of jail <laughs> and go back <laughs> to Boyd's bar. <laughs> you just, like, barely oh. got through that sentence. <laughs> Like, technically, there wasn't anything wrong with the sentence, but it just was still was not quite right. <laughs> it's like hearing an alien try to talk. <laughs> oh, God. It's like the woman from Dresden Files that you know is not quite human, and she's just saying some shit that you're like, oh. I mean, yeah, technically you're right, but also, what the fuck was that? <sighs> okay. Sorry, that was so, hysterical, though. <laughs> so back at Boyd's bar, um, he is drinking alone and looking miserable. And then Sheriff Mooney and his buddy show up mm -hmm. to um, to put Boyd in the same room with Mara, who sees him and immediately interrupts Mooney in the middle of his ridiculous gloating to let him know that that is not the guy. Oh my God. I was, once they were there and this whole scene was happening, I knew that she wasn't going to turn him in. I was like, oh, she's just letting him know. But it still was so incredibly ballsy of her that yeah. I just kind of wanted to applaud because he looks like he is ready to froth at the mouth by the end of oh, this. Yeah. He is so pissed. Oh, yeah. It's, I wrote in my notes that he is incensed, but I don't think that that really conveys the mm -hmm. look on his face. Yeah. And watching this, obviously, in that first scene where she gives it up, they're like, yeah, that's him in the hospital. It's confusing. Mm -hmm. And in my head, I'm like, so is this part of the deal that they worked out? Is this a plan? Is she just betraying him? And then when they – when this scene happens and she goes, oh, no, no, that's not him – you realize that she is playing her own different angle on this. She's mm -hmm. making her own weird little power play that I don't know that I expected from her in the little bit that we'd seen of her so far. I kind of did only because of the way that it went, like the way that they wrote the scene, um, not even necessarily a character thing, but simply that they made sure to have us, see that she's willing to make a deal that she's not necessarily that broken up over this guy. And also that we hear that Boyd offered him a totally different amount. I was laughing at the time that he like manages to pull it over on her because she didn't hear. But part of me was like, she might not, she might like 
extort him a little bit more. I mean, there's no reason not to. She's got this information. Um, so I didn't expect that to be the end of it. But the way that it needs to happen because of the contract that she signed mm-hmm. really is an interesting angle. Because somebody yeah. like him would definitely have that kind of contract. That makes total sense to me. Like, it feels yeah. a little bit plot convenient, but it <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't feel like a contrivance, you know, I'm just like, sure. yeah, that's, that's a guy who would protect himself for sure. So, yeah. Yeah. So maybe it's my own blinders that I, I saw her as opportunistic, but not necessarily calculating in this way. Okay. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I was really surprised to suddenly realize like, no, no, she's a, she's a player in this. She is not a pawn. Yeah. I think that what made me kind of assume that she would be is that a, like, a woman like her being with the guy that she's with and doing what she does and being, having been a doctor, I was like, she is a smart woman who made calculations to get where she is. And so she's got to, she's got to have some smarts on some level, but I just didn't know if they were actually going to pursue that or not. So it's nice that they are, because it's definitely much more interesting that way. Most definitely. So we leave the bar. Mm-hmm. And we go to <laughs> Raylan. We lose the bar. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we leave the setting of the bar. <laughs> and we go now to the setting of the jail house. Where... <laughs> <laughs> was that on purpose? That was a little bit on purpose. <laughs> um... <laughs> yeah, so uh... Raylan arrives at this county jail. And it turns out that Loretta started throwing his name around as soon as she got locked up. Painting the walls with my name. (laughs) That's a great way to say that. Yeah. And he tries to relate to her for like 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. And then decides that, yeah, no, she's staying in jail because... I wonder if it was not just because she was selling weed, but that she was dumb enough to sell weed to a cop's kid. That's the main takeaway that I had. It was just like, know your clients. What are you doing? You should have learned this from your father. You know what I yeah. mean? Like, <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. And she seems completely, not not completely dumbstruck, but she's, it was not what she was hoping for. Yeah. I... I, there's an interesting thing happening here because like Raylan on the one hand is trying to teach her and it's not, like he just tells her this story about how his dad left him overnight and she's like whoa your dad sounds like an asshole and he's like well yeah he pretty much was also I'm going to leave you here overnight and I'm like well <laughs> yeah, <that> Raylan <laughs> yeah you play out that casting a little bit and suddenly maybe that's not the best story yeah uh, but, uh, but yeah, Raylan is more than happy to leave her there and sucks to be you. Basically. Now, on the way out, she meets uh, Loretta's drug dealer boyfriend, Derek, who is a whiny little so-and-so. <laughs> and, and Raylan just completely brushes him off because he isn't worth anybody's time insofar as I can tell. Oh, my God. When he's like, hey, hey. Hey, 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 pig. I'm like, oh, really? This is what we're doing now. Come on, yeah. dude. Ugh. Get yeah, a life. Is, it, is that really like you're sitting in a police station that you want to start throwing around pig? Right. Because, really? um, like, I get it's the kind of thing that I'm like, well, you know, he's white. So right there, he's going to get away with it. But also just like, don't bring the heat on your on yourself. Like, you're yeah. doing all kinds of shit. And they already have eyes on you. Maybe just don't. But yeah, all right, and I mean, sure. I guess it just should, like reinforces, like, yes, he is that dumb. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so yeah, but he follows Raylan outside, calls him a dick. He leaves, and then coming up the stairs, he meets Loretta's new social worker, Allison. Oh, and what boy. do you think of her? She feels a little unstable somehow. Like, okay, explain. It's hard to explain. There's something about the way that they introduce her. It's like the, it's sort of like a cliche in terms of 
well, we have to make her competent and we have to make her hot. So what are we going to do to give her any personality? I know we'll make her awkward. And so they have this thing where she's like, oh, I'm surprised I even leave the house with my underwear on. And I'm like, really? So between that and then her like weird story about selling generals millions of units of uh sarin gas mask Masks, filter things yeah. <laughs> i was just kind of like i don't know what like there's something that feels wrong and i don't know okay. if it's the actress i don't know if it's for the plot and it's actually supposed to feel wrong but it just seems like she's either lying or she's just so uncomfortable that it feels like it's lying, even though it's not. Um, I don't know. It's really hard to put my finger on it, but I didn't like her. And it bugged me that he immediately is like, hey, what's up? Like, ugh. I, I kind of had an issue with that, too. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, I think she's fine. But I think, actually, you, you nailed it pretty well. Is that She seems like, it seems like they should be, like a rom-com meet-cute. Mm-hmm. But it's not really filmed that way or exactly played that way. Mm -hmm. So instead it just, it feels awkward and not like really funny, awkward, just sort of awkward, awkward. Yeah. You know, but that must've been an intentional choice because the show is good at, you know, setting the right tone for things. Mm -hmm. So what the hell is it? Yeah. I don't know. It's like when I stop and try and think about other characters that they've had that are awkward, it's hard to even really think of anybody because Usually those people are are awkward in a way that they are not aware of and they're playing her as if she is aware that she's a little bit of a disaster, Um, which I don't feel like we've really seen. So I think maybe just tonally that felt weird because the show hasn't really done that before. Everybody in this show has either been like very competent at what they do or cartoonishly incompetent. And not aware that they are so. You know what I mean? And this is more like, she's not cartoonish, but it is an exaggeration. But she knows it. So where does that leave us? And um, I don't know. I just have kind of this issue because it is a rom-com thing to just be like, oh, this woman is gorgeous, successful, whatever. But she keeps tripping. Oh, no. Like... Because that's the only thing that we can think of to give this woman a flaw of any kind. And luckily, this dude that she meets can look past her many clumsy moments to see the gorgeous, stunning, successful <laughs> beauty that's clearly right fucking in front of him. Um, all, all she had to do is learn to take off her glasses. And who right? knew? So it's yeah. just, uh, I don't know. I just... Both times, because I watched this episode twice, and I was just like, both times, kind of like, what is this? Like, they were having dinner by the end of the episode, and I just wasn't buying it at all. Like, Raylan is, he is a dude that, like, it's not like he isn't willing to jump in bed with women, but it always feels like it has to be a little bit easy for him. Mm -hmm. And when I say that, I don't mean, like, these women can't be any effort. I feel like he has to, it has to be almost no effort for him. Like the, you know, the woman that he was sleeping with that owned the bar that he lived over. Like, does it get much more straightforward than that? She's almost in your house already. And she's (laughs) also insanely hot. Um, But this lady, it's a weird thing to like get involved with her like it doesn't feel like Raylan the way that he approaches her right off the bat like that if I didn't know any better if this were like a king novel I'd say that he was enchanted or something but interesting okay (laughs) okay (laughs) no and and that's well that's part of why I just asked you immediately just like what do you think of her because it's a weird introduction and she's kind of a it was she's a character that we haven't really seen them do before Mm-hmm. And I don't know that this episode endears her to me at all. So, yeah. um, okay, well, we will, uh, we will see what happens with that <laughs> because yeah, something, she, I don't know. I've got know, a bad feeling about her that she's like working for somebody. There's something up. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. I don't know what it is. All right. 
But uh, she does, though, make a good point about essentially like, so you left the writer in jail. You think you're you're trying to scare her straight, but all you're really doing is making her feel like nobody gives a shit about her. Yep. Which I appreciated someone pointing that out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that like scaring you straight thing only works if you were like so sure that you had that somebody had your back that you weren't worried. Mm-hmm. And then they're like, oh, you thought that this was going to be easy. But with Loretta, she doesn't have anybody having her back. And she clearly invoked his name as like a last resort because yeah, this and is it's not something that she particularly seems proud of or is glad to have done. And if anything, she's used to being abandoned by people. Mm-hmm. So all you've done is reinforce don't trust anybody because they're just going to leave you stranded. Yep. Yeah. So now we go to Audrey's, which is currently being run by Dewey. Oh my God, but we see I about this. Boyd's guy Carl and Wade, the bartender slash hooker manager resident dum dum yes <laughs> and, um and carl is trying to collect money that mm-hmm. wade can't get a handle it can't get a hold of because dewey is never too far away from it yeah dewey stumbles into the middle of the conversation and they need to fake him out by saying that carl is upset that dewey's fat hooker got fired OMG. And the whole conversation's in pretty poor taste. Yeah. It was one of those um, wincy ones. Yeah. It's one of those, like, it's, again, okay, I guess. But, and I guess in this context with these guys, sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's the main thing. It's like, this show isn't actually, like, writing this to be funny. They're writing this to point out what assholes these dudes all are. So while I'm not a huge fan of it, it feels like this is one of the only ways that this is acceptable to me. So, all right, fine. You know? Yeah. But the thing is, I think that they do write it for that reason, but they do decide to play it as funny. And yeah, that's true. As a lifelong person of size, I just, all right, fine. Right. You know, I'll accept it. I'll roll with it. The show is, like I've said about other things, it's earned enough rope that, okay, <laughs> I'll let it go. And I'm like, you know, as a woman who has gained weight and didn't always used to have weight on, I really expected my, like, dating life to slow down when I put weight on, and it did not. Men love it, no matter yeah. what. Like, it's yeah. fine. So, you know, the fact that he's, like, all surprised, like, that's definitely a thing. And it's not just... A fetish, which some people can dismiss it as like, oh, he just likes fat girls. It's like, no, just fat women can be hot. Shocking, I know. Right. Um, so, um, yeah. It does It does like, give... Oh, fine. I, I do like that it gives Dewey the opportunity to to be in charge and to feel like he's in charge and making decisions. Oh, God. I, I like confidence on Dewey. <laughs> it, he wears it was it well. a little shocking to see how well he wore it, to be honest, because I thought he was going to make an idiot out of himself. And while he does inadvertently, because they're totally playing him in this moment. Yeah, the whole, the whole premise is, yeah. But... Yeah, but he still, like, kind of felt real a little bit. And I was like, all right, well, you know, like... Even though this isn't working out for you, I think you've got the potential to actually be able to, like, run some shit, maybe. But I don't know how real it is. Like, does he have to be on top of the world fucking two women at once every single day to be able to feel like this? And the <laughs> instant somebody calls him out, is he just going to crumble like a fucking... Well, that you know, that's just it. I, Dewey needs to be needs to run a business where he is completely, where absolutely everybody is completely subservient and nothing goes wrong. In right. those instances, he can be a decent boss, maybe, mm-hmm. <laughs> or he has the maybe. potential to be a decent boss. But I can't imagine any time when things suddenly get hard <laughs> or any sort of uh, nuance is necessary. Yeah, that that he would critical actually, thinking, critical thinking. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> uh, anything involving money or finances. Mm-hmm. Yeah, nothing like that is ever going to. Uh, he's not going to shine. <laughs> no. Any circumstance except for the exact dollars? <sighs> Three hundred oh, thousand, you nimwit. <laughs> oh, nimwit? God. Was it nimwit? 
Was no, it? it was nitwit. It was nitwit. Nitwit. Oh, yeah. yeah. Dimwit. That's the way that is. Nimwit isn't a thing. <laughs> yeah, nimwit is not a thing. My bad. Uh, so, after Dewey leaves, thinking he's done a good job, <laughs> um, Raylan visits Derek at his home, uh, attempted to try to convince him to break up with Loretta, but instead finds him being roughed up by Avon Barksdale and Roscoe. Oh, brother. This was uh, one step away from turning real ugly, which it apparently yeah. does later. Apparently it does. I'm not sure that in this, like, he's being menaced with a baseball bat here. Mm-hmm. I don't know if they were actually going to do that at this point. I, I think I feel like they were maybe just, this was still maybe just a little bit for show, but this could very easily have continued with them walking him out to the car and then going somewhere where they could be more actively violent. But he diffuses the scene before it goes anywhere like that. Mm-hmm. Um, he just essentially flashes his marshal's badge, has a little conversation with, uh, with Jay. I should pick a name for him. It's Jay. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I'm always surprised on this show and it's not the, just the show. Like, I think I'm just surprised in general and I shouldn't be, but at how, little people really like fall into line when they see a badge. And I guess if you've done this kind of shit your whole life, if you're somebody who has always been one step away from prison or has been to prison already a couple times, you're just not going to feel that like fear of God thing because you're probably not somebody who worries too much about authority unlike Mm -hmm. myself. And that's why you got (laughs) into this line of work. So, but I'm just, you know, like me, he flashes his badge and to me, I'm like, oh shit. Okay. Oh, how are you doing today? Officer? <laughs> you know, like that's me in that situation. Right. But these guys are just like, oh yeah, we almost did that. But you know, we just like wanted to have our weekends off. So <laughs> it's just like, well, okay. I, I love how personable they are. Mm-hmm. They're just, you know, they, they really, we've seen a lot of people who, even if they don't immediately, you know, stand up straighter when the cops walk in are still kind of bumbling or like, they're just, they get mean or they, these guys are just, they're more than happy to just sort of sit there and joke with them a little bit. Yep. And it doesn't uh... come, it doesn't come off as forced or like cheap or anything. Yeah, exactly. I really did. What was the thing that he said? Um, oh, and then if you kill anybody, it's, there's got to be all this paperwork with paperwork. it. And Raylan just goes, not for you, huh? Which I don't know why, but the way he responded to it like that just killed me. Oh, yeah. not for you, huh? Yeah, he's, he just, he's humoring them. Mm-hmm. But they eventually leave because why turn this into a situation involving, you know, the authorities? Right. And uh, Raylan then advises Derek that it is time to break up with Loretta and make her feel real special. When you do it. Make her feel like she's just too good for you. Um, which I don't think he's wrong in this, but I'm like, you know, it, it's hard for me after having just heard her social worker be like, you know, she feels like nobody gives a shit about her for him to be like, oh, so I'll take her boyfriend away from her. Yeah. It's like, you know, the guy's a shit bag. So he's in the right. I get why, why he's doing this. But it just did feel a little counterintuitive to me compared to mm-hmm. what he was like just told, but that's fine. Well, I think that that's why it tells him to do it like a gentleman. Yeah. Yeah. He's trying to do it as uh let her down as easy as he can. Exactly. But that way when, but that way when he immediately calls her as soon as he leaves the house, mm-hmm. he wants to let her know that, uh, yeah. And I, made sure that he's going to break up with her and uh, so we can get together and discuss it. And that way I can tell you how I made sure that he did it nice and easy. And so that way I, you know, right. I, I fixed everything and I took your advice into account. Dude. He's just, I don't know. Fine. Raylan. Sure. Why not? (laughs) Um, Sorry. I was going to start on another thing, but that's for later. We'll get there later. Okay. All right. All right. So back at the hospital, uh, Mara is sitting in the waiting room smoking an e-cigarette. And it, yeah, it's in the in the world of like people who vape, which is mm-hmm. like this giant sort of Doctor Who sonic screwdriver looking contraption, at least right. to me. 
this delicate little e-cigarette feels and it feels like a throwback and at the same time it feels like this is what people should this is what e-cigarettes should look like mm-hmm. they're like they're really small and they're not ridiculous looking but yeah it really is very elegant you're right i it, didn't really take yeah. notice of it at the time but i just the first time it. i the first time i saw somebody vaping i assumed it was a bong <laughs> like, i really was just like what the fuck is that <sighs> and yeah the e-cigarettes are always they're just they're they're small they light up at one end mm-hmm. and you breathe out steam and i don't know this to me feels like what the future should look like yeah i love that that's because like at the time when she st- when I, you first see it i didn't realize what it was so when he tells her you can't smoke that in here i'm like fucking duh you can't smoke that in here what are you even doing <laughs> and then she says well he said i could and i was like what and then i looked closer and i was like oh okay because i just like was mystified for a second i felt like did i miss because when i moved down here to texas there were still smoking sections in the restaurants that we went to there were still like smoking was allowed it's since been that's been done away with like but when i first moved down here we went to an applebee's and i fucking couldn't take it we had to leave because I'm just my like delicate northern lungs were not ready, <laughs> and uh, so I was kind of like, "Oh shit!" In Kentucky, are they still allowed to smoke in fucking hospitals? Like that is messed up. But no, she is just uh, smoking the correct type of thing, so it's fine. Yeah, it's so weird. I have such positive associations, like like the smell with smoking in public places. That I, th- I know that I'm looking at it through rose-colored glasses because I'm sure if we went back to that as a normal thing everywhere, I would be horrified. Oh, it's disgusting. It's uh, so disgusting. There was this place in Philly that we would go do um, karaoke at all the time. And it was great because it was this little Polish bar and the beers were wicked cheap. It was a, kind of a hole in the wall, so on karaoke night, not many people were there. So if we brought a good enough group, it was basically all of our own friends. And the only downside was that they allowed smoking. And all, a couple of our friends did smoke, like Mary Bailey smokes. Um, and the very few regulars that came to the bar, these old Polish dudes, they definitely smoked. And I would come home and wake up in the morning and have to change the pillowcase on my bed because yep. my hair reeked of smoke and it got on my pillow. I would have like undressed the night before and the reek of smoke coming off the pile of clothes on the floor was too much. I couldn't even walk past it. Everything went straight into the washing machine. And it got to the point where a couple of our friends just straight up were like, I would love to do karaoke night, but we got to go somewhere else because I can't take that anymore. Um, yeah, I can't. Cigarette smoke to me is like one of the most foul fucking things. The instant... I smell it. I just want to like rip it out of the person's hands and just be like, why are you like this? But no, nope, I totally get it. <laughs> I, it. I can't help it. I just, again, just positive, you know, associations of good times and people I don't see anymore. And so was it like people that you knew in high school that you're friends with? Or was it like family that smoked or it was, there was a little bit of childhood memories from old family members who smoked. I had my freshman year of college. We could still smoke in dorms. You could smoke you can, in someone's room if the if the people who Good lived God. in the room okay with it. And we had a group of eleven of us, and nine of us smoked. Not me, but I was one of the two that didn't. But they were just smoking all the time, and it was a it was a year where I had so much fun. And it was one of the first years where I felt like I was cool. I, I, <laughs> I've since come to realize that I'm not cool <laughs> at all. Mm-hmm. I've never been cool. I'm okay with it. I've accepted it. Um, but, you know, I just, I have a lot of memories of freshman year of college, a lot of memories involving cigarette smoke, a lot of memories involving um, a girl I hooked up with and some cigarette smoke. <laughs> and I'll just, oh, so the truth of, comes out. <laughs> But it just, I, I think of good times and wow, I had fun last night mm-hmm. is, but I also remember, you know, do you ever go to Rudy's in New Haven when you were there? No. Okay. It's one of the big Yaley bars 
And the first time I went there was when you could still smoke in there. And the place has, like, no windows. Ugh. And the place was covered in such a haze of smoke from your shins up that I nearly passed out. And then I went back a second time after they banned smoking indoors. And I was like, wow, this place has no character whatsoever. This place, <laughs> this place kind of sucks and I want to leave. <laughs> oh, no. So the smoke gave it a mystique. It, <laughs> Maybe it, if we fill this place fucking... Uh, clouds. We won't have to put any art on the walls or worry about it. It's kind of amazing, actually. <laughs> um, okay, so we're we're way off base. I'm sure nobody cares about my experiences in New Haven bars from Sorry, 15 years. Guys. <laughs> um, now, back at uh, back in the hospital, Mara's directed to go out to the stairwell to smoke, and then it pulls back, and we see that it's actually Jimmy. It's not anybody who uh, has the authority to tell her that. But Boyd mm-hmm. is waiting for her. And he learns that, essentially, he learns that she'll leave him alone if he gives her $300,000, which is the money that he promised to um, Paxton originally. Yeah, so that raised some questions, because did she, did she hear him? And like call his bluff, or did she just come up with the exact same number by accident somehow? I'm assuming that she knew more than she did, you know, than she was letting on. I really hope that's what it is, because that's kind of great. Oh, you thought you were going to give me that cheap, bitch? I doubt it. Exactly. Fantastic. (laughs) While they're talking in the stairwell, we go to Duffy uh, and Mike, who are hanging out in Boyd's bar, holding a meeting. Mm Mm-hmm. And uh, we don't realize it at first, but it turns out everybody else in the room is one of Boyd's drug dealers. And they are concerned that they no longer have any drugs. Yeah, you know, that would be a hindrance to your business if you suddenly don't have product. So, okay, that's fair. (laughs) So... Duffy is assuring everyone their next shipment is coming in soon. One of the guys, Cyrus, is not happy. He mm-hmm. is, you know, starting to get his hackles raised. And Boyd then waltzes in, smooths the whole thing over. He declares drinks on the house for everyone. And and all is well for the moment. For a second. Yeah. Yeah, this was a the kind of scene where, like, I really like the way that Duffy operates and I think he's a smart dude, but I also kind of was like, I'm not sure which one of them was handling it better because as it turns out, Boyd telling them wasn't a good move. So Mm. I'm not, even though I felt in the moment like Duffy wasn't being diplomatic enough. I'm sort of like diplomacy is probably not the way to go with drug dealers. Like, yeah, unless you are like part of a power group and you're trying to form an alliance. But if you're dealing with just like, you know, the brunt laborers who just go out and sling. Yes. Yeah, I think that might not be the method you want to employ with these guys. Yeah. Um, well, I, I feel in general, I think your instinct is right that I don't think Duffy is good in big groups. I don't think he is good in this room doing this, you know, this kind mm-hmm. of thing, because he's there waiting for Boyd, who was not showing up. Right. So if I decided to hold the meeting, we've only ever really seen him interact with one or two people at a clip. And I True. think he's very good in that environment. I mean, he's more of a businessman than a gangster, really, from everything yeah. we've seen. So I think he was absolutely out of his element. And Boyd did do what he had to do to smooth it over. It probably would have kind of gone this way if he'd been there from jump anyway, mm-hmm. I think. Yeah. But it just turns out he did say one thing too many, and uh, that's going to yeah. obviously come back to bite them by the end of the episode. Yeah. Um, so. Sorry. Go ahead. Nope. So uh, Raylan uh, returns to the marshal's office, and um, completely at random, Vasquez and Art give him temporary ownership of the mansion from the beginning of the episode. This was weird. Was that just me? No, it is. It's super weird and random, and it's not even like he came in here looking to do that. It felt almost like they wanted, like, it felt like they were looking to do this, and they were just trying to find somebody stupid enough to agree to do it. 
And they were like, <laughs> I know, here's this asshole who has a shit, like, bachelor pad that he'd be more than happy to get out of. And he won't ask too many questions. I can't think why, though, they would want this. Like, that's the part that I'm having a hard time kind of coming up with. But it I feel definitely like, felt, like, weird to me. I don't know. I feel like the episode plays up the idea that they thought that Raylan's stunt with the car was pretty funny. Okay. And so the best thing they can do to get into this guy's skin, because fuck that asshole, mm -hmm. is to let the same guy live in his house while the marshals hold the property. Yeah, that is pretty shit, man. And, like, damn. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, it, it's it's thin, mm -hmm. but, yeah, I feel like they were just sort of charmed by the idea that Raylan essentially stole this guy's car from in front of him. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, so they were just happy to continue to make this guy miserable. Yeah. All right. That's all I got. I buy that. that. Um, we also find out, just sort of off the cuff, that Art got a phone call from Sammy Tonin looking for Raylan the day before Sammy died. Yeah. And Raylan feigns ignorance. Like, I don't know. We talked once at a stable so and a season and a half ago. Yeah, and, buddy. All right. And Art, Art seems to accept it. He goes like, okay. But he's clearly just chewing this over and chewing this over. Because that doesn't make sense. This, I don't know, like, I don't understand, I, what doesn't make sense about it? Well, I think it's just strange that, I feel like for Art, it is strange to him that his reckless, reckless violence prone Marshall got a call from a drug lord right before Drug Lord died. Drug Lord, that ostensibly he doesn't know, would get a phone call just before then looking for this guy. I think but, maybe that, that it doesn't make sense, but that this is weird. I mean, I think what Raylan says, though, maybe he knew the end was near and he was looking to make a deal. I think that's a very solid, if totally untrue, premise. And he kind of dismisses that in such a way that I thought was surprising because it feels like it could be true and I mean we know fucking Sammy Tonin isn't the sharpest tax so doing something that doesn't make the most sense doesn't feel outside of his purview at all you know yeah and I don't know I, I think maybe I've just watched enough cop shows that I'm okay with the idea of a hunch or just mm -hmm. someone saying like this doesn't make sense it does make sense but that just doesn't make sense so I don't know, but it's not like Art jumps down his throat about it. He just goes like, okay, all right, thank you. Well, but, he doesn't though, because like when he presents that idea, he says, yeah, I thought about that. But if he was wanting to make a deal, he already knew all those people in Detroit. Why would he call you? So he doesn't like leave it. And I don't know. Did he mean all those people like, all of the marshals in Detroit? Was that what he meant by that? Or was he talking about other crime people? I assumed I was, I assumed it was really that he has this whole other justice system in Detroit already, or that he's got this whole other life in Detroit. Why would he call this one marshal down in Kentucky? Yeah. Um, out of all the people he could have called, why would he choose you? Yeah. Um, Especially given how closely related he was to what happened with Winona and Raylan at the right. end of last season. So, okay. That's again, he, and he doesn't pursue it. He doesn't, you know, he gets distracted by Loretta showing up. But, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, but you can tell that Art is just. It's, it's nagging at him. It's nagging at him. Exactly. Exactly. Um, but yeah, so Loretta shows up. And Raylan starts to console her for getting mm -hmm. broken up with. Oh, real quick, before oh, we quite yeah. move on from that, can we just, like, just marvel for a second that somebody as stupid as Sammy Tonin was in power at all because he's willing to fucking call Raylan at work looking for him? 
<laughs> like this fucking asshole deserved to die much sooner than he did. And frankly, what the fuck? Like, I can't get over the fact that he even did that. Hey, this could have gone so well. There, did, <clears throat> there was no reason why this couldn't have worked out exactly the way that it was planned. But you had to go and open your goddamn mouth in front of everybody and just make some shit, just some stupid, shitty decisions. That do you not have his cell phone? Really? You're gonna call him at work? Okay, yeah, that makes sense. You dumb. Ugh. Yeah. <laughs> no argument there. Like I don't. I feel like you could explain it in a way. It was still a really stupid move when you have alternatives. He shouldn't have to be looking for ways to explain this shit because it's not ugh, whatever. It Just does make, the fucking worse. I hate you. It does make me wonder if Quarles back in season three wouldn't have been a better head of the family. Right. Despite like, all of his failings. Yep. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. Poor stupid Sammy. So Raylan is consoling Loretta over the loss of her boyfriend, mm -hmm. uh, only to find out that, no, he didn't break up with her. He's just missing. Surprise! <laughs> Surprise. And yeah, she puts on a pretty good show here, don't she? She does. <laughs> she does. Um, now, we cut then to that night, Jay and Roscoe and Derek, and they are forcing Derek to dig for the money mm -hmm. that they ripped off and Derek can't find it. Oh man, and this is rough. Like it took me a minute at first to realize, cause you know how laughing and crying can sound really similar sometimes. And for a second I thought he was laughing and I'm like, why is he? And then I realized that he's like pretty much sobbing throughout almost this entire scene. Yeah. <laughs> cause he is sure he's going to die. And mm -hmm. he should be sure, because that is exactly what they were intending. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he is. Uh, and I like that he doesn't figure this out, but they realize it takes them, you know, once they realize that, like, no, clearly this is happening. I assumed that he was keeping them occupied, for lack of a better term. Like, I'm just going to keep digging mm -hmm. and swearing to them I'm going to find it. But, no, he really thought it was here, and it's not. And that's because Loretta played him. Oh, my God, so good. Yeah. Uh, I love that. He's like, it stings, doesn't it? She was right not to trust your pussy ass. <laughs> oh my God. That fucking killed me. Yeah. That stings, doesn't it? That one in particular. That was good. <laughs> and uh, yeah, they inform him that, uh, yeah, this sucks for you, but you were going to end up in this hole regardless. Mm -hmm. But uh, Raylan suddenly leaps out of the shadows with a shovel, yeah, smashes like Roscoe in the face. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so he temporarily rescues Derek, and Jay and Roscoe reveal that they work for Hot Rod, mm -hmm. and then Derek reveals that it was Loretta who got them mixed up with selling weed for Hot Rod in the first place. Yeah, because he's like, how the hell did you get mixed up with someone like Hot Rod? And he just looks at him and goes, guess. Yeah. Oh, I loved that moment. Just like, you fucking dummy. What do you think? Yeah. And and maybe it was just me, but I'd gotten the impression previously that, like, her boyfriend was a scummy drug dealer and she fell in with him. Not that she was, like, an angel who got corrupted. Right. But I assumed much more initiative on his part. Yeah, like, definitely. Yeah, no, this was all her, which makes total sense for her character. Yeah. It sure do. Sure do. Uh, now we go briefly. This is the other scene with Mara where she is pulled over Ugh. by Sheriff Mooney, who yanks her out of her car. Yeah, that's pretty pretty harsh, man. Yeah, throws her on the ground, puts a gun in her face, and then threatens to arrest her for trying to kill her husband unless she thinks again about what she saw and who it was that was in her house. And I love scenarios like this in shows because the thing is Boyd did do it <laughs> like you know this guy isn't trying to force her to lie about it he's trying to force her to tell the truth about it 
which, right. uh, you know, ordinarily one would think would be the good guy's side. But he is so fucking awful and has his own whole agenda for it. And also that he points out that he got word from one of his people who was like wa- watching her that she got a visit from Boyd at the hospital. So he's keeping an eye on things and maybe wouldn't have been able to quite put everything together um, without taking a few extra steps here. So, yeah, I'm like a little like grudgingly impressed, but (laughs) I'm also mad at Boyd for making that kind of misstep because that feels pretty risky and it didn't occur to me at the time that it was risky to go in there and visit her at the hospital, but I feel like it should occur to somebody like him who tries to be careful. Right. Um, so yeah, I don't know, but I'm on her side still, obviously, because frankly, that yeah. guy, she deserves to get paid for putting up with that asshole. Um, yeah, any, any bit of, uh, any bit of respect you may have gained for him, for his tenacity is completely undercut by him being a predatory horror machine yes yeah i mean he is caressing her face with the gun in the scene which is something that really could look super cliche and dumb and it doesn't no so yeah that's you know appreciate that oh god so now we go to a random alley where raylan and loretta and derek and jay and roscoe are hanging out because raylan set up a meeting with hot rod Mm-hmm. And Jay tries to talk him out of it, and Raylan tells him, "My general rule is, you keep talking, I put you in the trunk." <laughs> Terrible conversationalist. Which is true. <laughs> yeah. And and Raylan is not bluffing because we've seen him put many people in the trunk over four seasons. He, just he sure it. has. Yeah. Um. Hot Rod shows up, and essentially Raylan says. Get out of Harlan and let this go. You're talking to fucking teenagers. This sh- this is not their fault that this went bad. It mm-hmm. is your fault for dealing with teenagers in the first place, you idiot. Yep. Yeah, if you uh if you get involved with teenagers and weed, are you one of those people that walks under a flock of birds and then gets mad that you get some shit on your head? Yeah. He's really dismissive here. Um, yeah, yeah, this was like, I'm wondering how this is going to go for him in the long term. I feel like this was, I feel like I understand why he handled it the way he did and it wound up working out all right for now, but I feel like that's not going to last. We'll see. Yeah. Yeah. Hot Rod is, uh, he's not impressed and we've never seen these two characters together, you know, even though we've seen Hot Rod for several episodes now, Mm -hmm. this is really their first introduction. And, uh, yeah, but. Hot Rod is not not impressed with Raylan's, you know, threats. Yeah. And then Raylan makes the bigger threat of basically I would kill you all and I would make it look legal. Yeah. Which yikes, man. <laughs> yeah, that's he, he frames it in a way that makes it sound a lot more badass than that, but that's basically what he says. I would kill three of you before you even got your guns unholstered, and I would take my chances with the other two. And you see this little star? That would make it legal. Well, yeah. shit. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah, there's not much you can say about that. Nope. And so, he, like, because one could try and be like, oh, you think you could shoot us that fast? But Raylan has that rep. They all know it. Right. Everybody's aware that he isn't talking out of his ass. He is not bluffing. He is not, you know, trying to create a reputation for himself. He has one and he's cashing in on that shit now. Yeah. So, yeah, there's not much to say after that. So we instead go right to the car convert, the car ride afterwards. Mm -hmm. And uh, Raylan drops Derek off at a bus stop. Oh, my God. I fucking died a little bit. He is so, like, he's so cold about it, too. Mm -hmm. And this kid, like, are you serious? And he waits and then is like, I have a gun. Get out of my car. Oh, my God. Can I just say, now, I know that it is a common thing 
for people to be like, well, when I was a kid, I never acted like that and rewrite history a little bit. I'm not trying to pretend that I was a perfect child because I pulled some shit, especially as a teenager. Once I started to get real horny, then I was just like impossible. But when I was, when I was before the time in my life where I started getting into boys and the whole deal, when I got into trouble, I was so fucking scared that this uh, this moment where he has just had his ass saved by this guy. He owes him everything. He was about to be dead. Like a millisecond later, he was going to be dead. And he has the balls to cop an attitude because this guy isn't dropping him off where he wants to be. <laughs> Get the fuck over yourself, you little fucking brat. Who are you? Teenagers. Oh my god. Like, I just, I can't, I, I, I just can't, you know? It's just, it's just, just, you grew up, you grow up a different way, you do different things, you learn different things, and you just have a totally different outlook. And it's so, and it's, I'm not trying to say that it's like unrealistic, Because I was definitely the type that I'd go to my friends' houses and I'd hear the way they talked to their parents and I would be horrified that their parents let them get away with it. Yeah, like you're just sitting there like, how do they not get thrown into their room? How am I still here and not being told, you know what, I think this is over and it's time for Natasha to go home? Because that shit was what would have happened with me when I started a cop and attitude, which I very rarely did. So... I've seen that people can be terrible and just kind of inexplicable to my mind as a kid. Um, But it is, it is just for me, one of those like moments where I'm just like you, this dude, you should be kissing his fucking ring right now. And instead you're sitting here complaining because I want a chocolate ice cream, not vanilla. Like dude, go home and thank the stars above that he was there to drag your ass out of a, your literal grave. You were standing in your actual grave. Holy yeah. shit. Get some perspective, buddy. Ugh. Yeah. Also, anyway. if I'm Derek, I'm thinking about the fact that um, the guys that were about to put him in that grave are not dead. Right? <laughs> and that Loretta is the one that kind of betrayed you and you're just like, hey, Loretta, let's go. Yeah, he that's that's true. He, and then he even says like, "Yeah, come on, let her, Loretta, let's go." As and if I was he just like, just "How realize. are you not? Yeah, how are you not angry right now? Maybe he doesn't believe them. Maybe it didn't really register. I don't know. Yeah, maybe, maybe, or maybe he's like trying to plan his own like moment where he's gonna get back at her, which would be horrible, but yeah. kind of deserved." Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, he is completely shocked also that, yeah, Loretta t- is not moving from the car. Mm-hmm. And he is, he looks very betrayed. More betrayed yeah. than when they found out that she moved the money on him. Right? Yeah, it's kind of funny because, like, there, like, I was still, even though I knew that it was her that had done all of this, I was still operating under this, like, oh, well, he pulled her into this. So she's choosing not to go with him because she's decided to make a better choice in her life. And it's really, that's not actually how it is. Like, he, he's he's the one that should be going, well, bye, Loretta. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of weird, I guess, that I'm, like, still treating this like her, she's the victim somehow. Um, but, well, whatever. Anyway. Yeah. And... <laughs> Well, you know, it is kind of when, – when we first see him, he looks to me like he's like 23. And when we met Loretta in season two, she was what, like 13? Mm-hmm. So by season five, she's probably 15 or 16. Right. Um, I guess it, it feels weird to me if and maybe he just looks older than, you know, than I think he is. But that I, that, that puppy dog idea of – I don't know, fathering around your girlfriend like a puppy dog. <laughs> um, 
I don't know. I just find it weird because he looks so much older than her. That yeah, he be, that's fair. You know, so fooled by that or so taken in by, you know, ooh, boobies. That, yeah, right. I don't know. It, it's just weird. But whatever. Whatever. He's in yeah. a bus stop. Raylan is driving Loretta home. Um, and by the time they get to her house, Raylan realizes that she played him mm-hmm. into solving her problem. Because after she moved the money, <laughs> she put on an act for him. Oh, and, and But she comes right back at him and says, I didn't play you. You are who you are. You were going to go find him as soon as you found out he was missing. Yep. Yeah, I mean, that's still playing him, though. I know, but it's it's not her convincing him to do anything he wasn't going to do otherwise. It's just her playing the odds more than anything else. Yeah, I guess that's true. And it's not but, like she so maybe set semantics. him up to be missing to trick him into something, but she kind of did, right. though. Like yeah, she, I, Well, yeah, she did. So, now yeah, I stand by it. She totally played him. Yeah, so may, I, I think maybe I'm just arguing semantics. So. Yeah. Yeah, but she was... Uh, she was very calculated with all of this, and Braylon says, you know, just please take it easy on the rest of us sometimes. I loved that line, honestly. <laughs> I really did, like, because she is a force to be oh, reckoned yeah. with, and she is how old? Supposed to be, like, 15, maybe? Something like that, yeah. High school age, at least. Yep. So, we have just a couple of final scenes here. First, we go to the street corner, where Cyrus is basically fucking with the junkies oh my god what is this and yeah i don't know (laughs) he's shooting them with like rubber bullets or i don't even know (laughs) i didn't even put it to okay this is cyrus that was getting mad at the bar at the meeting yes yeah i didn't even put that together that that was him he looks different here somehow okay (laughs) Yeah, he's well. He's smiling, so maybe that's maybe something. that's it. Yeah, he looks like he's actually having a good time here. Yeah, but uh, yeah. he gets approached by Candy, who is one of the the local hookers, mm-hmm. and uh, he tells her sadly that uh, he's a little dry right now. And her answer is, "Oh, well, in that case, then so am I." <laughs> Oopsies. Yeah, but he promises, "Don't worry. There's a shipment coming in with." He tells her tomorrow. Yeah. She goes, "Oh, okay." <laughs> And oh my God. End of this scene. thing that he does where he's like, he's giving these addicts a few dollars to run away from him so that he can shoot at them with his like pellet gun or yeah. paintball gun or it's not paintball because there's no paint, but whatever kind of gun, it's not, you know, enough to break the skin as he puts it, but it is still like a fucked up thing to do. Ugh, this guy is trash. Yes, totally. <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, but he gets talked to, he tells her what's going on because she's got pop rocks and she's got a thing that she does. It's like your dick is in a bowl of popcorn. Yeah. They're does not that, subtle about that. Does that sound good to you, Alan? I, you know, not so much. That's like, not so much. I'm not judging if this is something that somebody likes, but I just, nothing about that sounds good. Like to me. I just, you know, I mean, try and imagine what it's like to have a dick. I have to just, you know, pretend here, but mm. I, I won't say I'm not intrigued because it's not like this is the first time I've ever heard of this. Right. But again, when you phrase, when you compare it to that, I just, all I picture is like, ow, 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 right? ow, 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 ow. So I, I don't know. <laughs> oh my God. And I was cracking up because right after I watched this episode, I listened to an episode of the flop house, an old one. And they're talking about putting your dick in a bowl of popcorn as it pops. And the guy's like, you can try that at home. Just scoop some hot cinders out of your fireplace and pour them down your pants. And I was like, yeah, man, that's a uh, yikes. Like, I don't know. This, uh, I did give a blowjob with uh, an Altoid in my mouth once. I was, I was actually going to say there is like the Altoid thing. Yeah. That seems uh, Mike Gallagher, <laughs> but Gallagher. he was not a big fan. Like he liked it for a second. And then he was like, I feel like I'm going numb or something. Like, I think we better not now. 
kind of had one of those moments of like, is there a side effect to this that we just don't know about? Cause, um, Ooh, what is that? So, yeah. yeah. Never tried that. There was a chili powder incident, but that oh, was God. That wasn't intentional. That oh, wasn't intentional. Oh, was it like on your hands or something? Uh, it wasn't on my hands, but yes, it was, uh, it, 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 it killed the mood pretty quickly. Oh no. Yeah. Yeah, that was really it's like it was really like oh wow oh that's ooh wow it's oh ah oh oh no oh no 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 okay <laughs> okay I gotta I'll be I I'll be right back I'll be oh, oh ah yeah there was a shower involved it was bad <laughs> yeah my ex he had been cutting up jalapenos and he went to pee yes and he mm-hmm. came he like I heard him like give a little like squeal from the bathroom and then I heard the shower turn on. And I was like, babe, are you okay? And he's like, oh, I will in a second. I was like, what the fuck? And yeah, he came out and he was like, apparently did not wash my hands well enough after uh, cutting those jalapenos up. I was like, oh, oh, no. Yeah. And I guess out. that's a pretty common thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, I, yeah, <laughs> that's a thing that happens. Bummer. So... Um, yeah, that's a detour for you guys. Yeah, exactly. That's a, that's Welcome enough about my junk. Show. Enough yeah. about my junk for one episode. Um, meanwhile, Dewey Crow is about to get some again when Maybe. he's interrupted again because it turns out Daryl Junior is making himself at home. Oh and- my god, this guy just like. I I love the way that he says, like, so good to see you again. Like, he is so aware. Nobody wants me here. Yeah. Oh, well. Like, there's something and, about him kind of almost being gleeful about knowing that they don't want him here, and yet they can't do shit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you can just see in Dewey's eyes just going like, oh, fuck, oh, fuck, oh, fuck, yep. oh, fuck, oh, fuck. But, yeah, what are you not going to say no to family? Mm-mm. So... And he has, like, this kind of beady look when he's like, you've got a real nice setup here. And I'm like, oh, boy, this yeah. is going to be a problem because he's going to try and do something with this and take it or God knows what. Yikes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And also, then we have- oh, can yeah. I just, like, he when he gets interrupted, the thing that he yells out, <laughs> unless Adolf Hitler has risen from the grave... Oh dear. Just... <laughs> oh dear. Yeah. I forget. I forget sometimes. He's got a fucking swastika on his chest and I still I forget sometimes. Yep, he sure you does. Know? He sure does. And I think that's only half of what he says too. He says if it, it, Adolf Hitler has risen from his grave and is standing in my bar or something like that. Yeah, something like that. Um But uh we have a couple of a couple of wrap-up scenes after this. There is a quick scene of Art making a phone call to the police in Detroit. Yeah, how about this, Art? Art just can't leave shit alone, man. He can't. He can't. He's trying to figure out what happened with Sammy Tonin and uh, where he was the night of Nikki Augustine's murder. And, like, I get wanting to know... But also, like, man, do you really want to know? Do That's you? A good... That's a good you know, question. I don't like. When this... it... Well, Sorry, you know, when this happened back when this happened back in season two, Art decided he didn't want to know. Yeah, that's kind of where I'm at right now. Where I'm just like, ah, I don't know. I feel, I feel like this is him, like going against his better judgment a little bit. And uh, Mm -hmm. I wish that he would refine his blinders and put them back on. Cause it's just not like there are times the fucking thing in season two with the money. Yeah. That was, that was a stupid, stupid situation. That one, I could have forgiven him more. For deciding not to let it go. Because it was just that kind of fucking... 
It was inexcusable. You accidentally took the money? No. Like, he he let it go, and that was very generous of him. But I don't really, like, feel like he should have. I'm not particularly invested in Winona and the fact that she made that kind of dumbass judgment yeah in my opinion is totally it, she deserves to get punished for it she really does like she's a fucking adult and she knew what she was doing but this guy was gonna come and kill his entire family I just don't feel like this is the same this is much more worthy to me of getting a blind eye turned to it than the money was. I, you know, I don't disagree with you, but I think art on some level sees it exactly the opposite. This first thing was some dumb shit with money. And at the end of the day, nobody got hurt. So whatever you're an ass, but okay. This is one of your deputies that is mixed up in somebody getting murdered. Yeah, I guess, but like, you the whole thing was that he was saying it was going to happen anyway the whole thing was sit back because he's going to get got and Raylan just knew better because he was trusting that Sammy would take out Nico it was Nico right is that his name? Uh, Nikki 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 um even though from everything we've seen about Sammy he would not be capable of that without having his fucking hand held so he basically was just like relax Raylan and let the guy get murdered and Raylan was just like well it won't work unless I push it a little well I, we, we will have to <laughs> see where this I, just, I mean that's I, we will have to see where this goes because all we know right now is that for whatever reason, Art can't quite leave this alone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just feel like I get I get what you're saying, but basically all Raylan did was ensure that the thing Art was banking on would actually happen. So, you know. Yeah, I mean, not that Art knows this, but Raylan was... It was more than that. That was him literally just turning his back while somebody got murdered and then claiming ignorance. Yes, but not, but, yeah, not that Art like knows he doesn't that, know but, that part. Yeah. Um, yeah. Again, and I think honestly, you and Art might just have an ideological difference because you have long maintained you're totally okay with people doing bad shit if they're smart about it. Mm -hmm. So, I, and I don't think Art shares that worldview. So, yeah, that's um, probably yeah. true. But. But we will see. We will see. Uh, while Art is making phone calls, Raylan is sharing a wine and Chinese food with Allison at his new oh, mansion. That so good right now. <laughs> mm. Sorry. Distracted now. Mm, donuts. It's okay. You're not missing much in this scene, really. Um, <laughs> we hear a little bit about Allison's past. He says selling military surplus. And uh, she points out Raylan's many failings as a human being. Yeah. Why are you here then? <laughs> like that, yeah. that was my main thing in this scene is that she's going to be like, well, you know, I just got turned off to dudes like you a while back. And I'm like, Duh, apparently not. Cause here you are. Yeah. And also all like, if that's just your general take anyway, and this guy has all these other red flags as he puts it then yeah for real why you here then um but whatever yeah this this scene like you said not missing anything agreed yeah uh and then our final scene is uh, in the hospital where paxton begins to wake up out of his coma mm -hmm. tough, tough son of a bitch yeah, um i was not happy about that this yeah. complicates everything i mean it doesn't for what is her name? Mari? Mara. Mara. It, it would simplify everything for her because he has flat out said, or would flat out say who did it, hopefully, if he was capable. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I just like, you know, 
this guy is so awful that I just want him to fucking die. Can't you just die? It's never so, that easy with y'all. Yeah. It isn't. Uh, like, this is a kind of repeat of something that happened in Twin Peaks where there's a character that it's a brutal attack and I assumed they were dead and they were not. And now they're fucking hanging around complicating shit and being fucking irritate, irritating and uh, I'm just wishing to God they had just died. Just do, just die. But yeah, same thing. Yeah. So they weren't as no, that's a lie. I was going to say they weren't as bad as him, but no, they totally were. My bad. <laughs> it's easy to forget stuff. So Paxton is waking up, and actually, I'm sorry, that's not the final scene because the final scene is Boyd going to the drug pickup. Yeah, that was what I thought you were. I completely forgot about Paxton waking up right. thing. And those um, notes into a single. <laughs> um, but yeah, and Boyd shows up to find. Everybody dead, and the drug's gone. It is a fucking, like, scene out of hell, man. Just, like, a bunch of abandoned cars with their headlights still on, bodies everywhere. Um, This was... So, my question is, how did this do... Like, do they have the same meeting place for every shipment? It goes out of the crime bridge, so presumably. <laughs> um Wait, what about a crime bridge? Well, I said that the other the other side of the Harlan crime bridge. Just like there's one bridge where they do all their crime. Oh, was that where this was? I actually, I, I actually, it might be. I was making a joke, but because like that would, yeah, that would make sense. Because you're right that it does seem to be like the set piece all the time. Um, but yeah, it just kind of because for me it was like not an obvious misstep that Boyd tell them when the shipment's coming in, unless it's widely known when, like where this happens, in which case he should have known better. But if he didn't realize that people had, you know, nailed it down where it happened, then yeah, and, he couldn't and have known. It does just seem to be a clearing off to the side of the road. It does, mm-hmm. doesn't seem to be any identifying features there, but, uh, but yeah, I don't know, but it seems like with the, you know, uh, the parties that may have been involved or the, the number of people that may have been involved, anybody could have, you know, gotten persuaded into giving up that information. Yeah, so, that's true. Um, yeah, Duffy's but we... Be so mad. Duffy is going to be so mad. And again, this was the, the final shipment coming from Canada. So, mm-hmm. there's problems. Yeah, I'm like, I kind of, because like you said, I think you're right. Duffy is not as good with people as Boyd is. And he's certainly not as good at relating to, you know, the redneck quotient in town. Yeah. Um, But when you want somebody to rain holy hell down, that's when Duffy. So mm-hmm. I'm sure looking forward to hopefully something like that happening because they got to know from the way that um what was what was his name again the guy who was shooting crackheads was um i'm wanting to say uh, cypher Ugh. i can't want to say curly cyrus I said that with a c cyrus thank you i was close cypher cyrus that's not bad yeah. um but they're going to have to like have an inkling that it was him cuz he made a bunch of noise he kind of attracted attention to himself here so I'm figuring they're going to zero in on him pretty quick. Mm. So this isn't uh, this isn't going to be so much a mystery as like a you know takedown kind of thing that they're going to have to do. Right. And it's sort of still unclear to me the kind of resources that Boyd has now, because Duffy. While he has had connections to people with resources, he's only ever really been with his one, like, bodyguard dude. You know, like, True. we never really see him with that much in terms of backup, unless it's, like, the occasional independent contractor here and there. So, I wonder what what Boyd is capable of now that he has a partnership. I don't right. know. I, I don't know. 
Um, so yeah, that's that. It's a good episode. Yeah. I liked it. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it's good. It's you know completely. Uh, I won't say it. I was going to say completely disposable, but that's not true at all. Actually, it's no. inconsequential. I think it certainly compared to last episode. Mm-hmm. But it's good. It's fun. It's you know, it's all right. <laughs> Yikes. Damning with faint praise. Sorry. Do do we not say I anymore? Sorry. I don't. Did we ever? I'm not sure we're allowed to say that, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. What do you call yourself? Puerto Rican. Yeah, I know you're allowed to say that, but what do I say? Puerto Rican. Ooh, that does not sound right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, guys, Thirty Rock is so good. So um. Bad. <laughs> so for new patrons we only have one this week richard Ooh. weinstein so well, welcome richard thank you so much for becoming a patron and i love you i love you deeply and personally to an uncomfortable degree oh. um we don't have any new reviews either it has been a very slow week for me so guys show me some love become yeah. a patron at patreon.com backslash unspoiled or shop at uh, unspoiledpodcast.com backslash Amazon or just leave a review on iTunes. That's free. And it's a really, really helpful way to get my Patreon stats up because new listeners is new potential patrons and people can find the show more easily when it has more reviews. It shows up closer to the top of the listings when they search for uh, titles and stuff like that. So guys, yeah, all of you get on that because I'm feeling a little bit unloved this week. I gotta confess, it's making me a little sad. Been looking for your opportunity to be, you know, to to, to feel special, to be, you know, a, to to be loved in the eyes of Natasha and the of the unspoiled uh, community. This is your mm-hmm. opportunity. Yeah. This is your opportunity. Step up, people. Step up to the streets, the pod streets. Step Peace. up 3D. Um, yeah, and that's about all I'm going to go on with with the uh, announcements this week. What do you got? Anything you'd like to add? No, nothing new. Nothing new. Uh, My Twitter, at Al Kingsley. Everything else is same as always. Yeah, you guys know where to find me. Um, Facebook.com backslash unspoiled pod, Twitter at unspoiled show, or at Natasha Writing if you want to follow my more personal Twitter account. Um, if you are a patron and you haven't already, make sure to register for the patrons only group on Facebook because that is super active and fun. And uh, also register on unspoiledpodcast.com as a patron, and I will give you access to all of the back episodes, the uh, what I call the legacy patrons only episodes. Um, because there's a lot on there to listen to, so you will have some catching up to do. And if you're $5 and above, you'll have access to Twin Peaks, which I'm doing with Maggie, and I just reached the middle of season two when things fucking hit the fan. Ooh. Oh my god, I wasn't ready. Um, and if you are $4 and below, you'll get access to Sherlock, which I'm doing with Rashawn once a month. So those And those are pretty Ooh. long episodes because the show is so long, so... yeah. Yeah. Yeah, guys. Um, all right. Well, I guess that's everything. Thank you guys so much for listening and being here. Remind me that you're here with a review. Just do that. That's all I ask. And we will see you next week with a new episode. Bye, Bye guys. Bye, motherfuckers. <laughs> God, get at you, boy. You're trying to go far, fall back. I go hard on this lonely road, trying to make it home. Doing the bomb, I'm also pissed off. That was an Unspoiled Network podcast.